very, very close. And they're still, you know, and she's got five of her own oh, wow. now. So Emily just lends in there. And I'm sure it was hard for her. Good evening, everyone. Good to have you with us today on this uh, uh, beautiful uh, spring day. The sun came out several times, and it looked so attractive. I walked outside and lost my toupee and froze to death and went right back inside the house. Uh, it was a windy, windy day, and we've had several of them recently, uh, but uh, beautiful that sun sh shine. I was talking with my mom this morning, and we said, are we going to see the sunrise? It was so cloudy, and then uh, all of a sudden there was a break in the clouds, and here came the sun. It was beautiful, and then uh, cleared off so that we could enjoy that. I hope you're having a great week, those that are joining us online, and uh, a lot of folks in preparation for tomorrow's service, and we hope that uh, if you're watching tonight virtually that you will join us tomorrow evening as uh, we... Uh, a tribute to the Last Supper. Uh, it'll be a short service. It'll begin at seven o'clock in the evening and we'll stream it live. And we encourage you to uh, get uh, some grape juice and uh, a uh, cracker or a piece of bread and celebrate with us as we have communion that evening after uh, special music and then uh, a short uh, devotional from God's Word. Uh, we have for the last three years uh, on uh, this Thursday evening, considered the atmosphere of uh, the Last Supper. And uh, we considered uh, the first year the betrayal at the Last Supper. The second one, uh, the second year, we, we discovered the greatness at the Last Supper. And uh, I won't give it away, but tomorrow evening we have the third in a series. Um, and we hope that you can come and be with us. And enjoy the time. Again, there will be a short service, and um, uh, we hope that you can join us for that. Um, we have a lot of things going on um, as far as people um, with some health issues, and we're going to get into that a little later on. Uh, but for right now, uh, we continue our series in uh, great questions about or from the Bible. And we'll get into that. Uh, it's kind of an interesting question that was given to me, um, not from someone at our church here, not a member, but from um, on, an online visitor. And the question was, Pastor, I have a lot of questions about the contradictions in the Bible. So uh, we're going to address that this evening, and it should be a good time to be together. But let's start tonight with a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for this time that we have. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. How wonderful it is to have Christ as our Savior as we visit through our mind this time of the year and all that you went through for us. Uh, we're amazed again at how much someone could love us, uh, even when we are, for the most part, unlovable. And so, Lord, uh, tonight as we focus on this service, we think of tomorrow's service um, retracing the moments uh, so long ago when uh, Jesus uh, uh, met with his disciples and had the last uh, time with him, referred to as the Last Supper. So I pray, Father, that you prepare our hearts for that tomorrow. But bless our time tonight as we look into your word and focus on your word and uh, help us to be gracious and good and also very honest and um, transparent in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Amen. So, in full disclosure, good evening, in full disclosure, the question that came to me was, I have a lot of questions about the contradictions in the Bible. Um, so, I contacted the person who submitted the question, and uh, uh, tried to um, understand exactly what the question was. And they rephrased the question by saying, I have a lot of questions about the apparent contradictions in the Bible. So they were very gracious about that. Oh, no, I didn't mean, just, I don't believe that they're contradictions, but I, I don't know how to explain them. And so they wanted to know about these apparent contradictions. So when we approach the subject of apparent contradictions in the Bible, the first thing I must determine and I'll apologize right here, but I, I look at everything in life systematically. Um, you know, I always find a beginning point, and then I just go through it step by step by step. That's just the way my mind's trained and worked, and it's fairly simple. I don't even have to concentrate much about it. It just works that way. And the first thing I must determine when I hear the question, the apparent contradictions in the Bible, is the question, what Bible? What Bible are you talking about that have these apparent contradictions? There are so many different versions today that contradict each other, and they do it multiple times. So to which Bible are you referring when the question is, why does the Bible have so many contradictions? Okay. Um, uh, secondly, I must say, in order to approach this subject, you must have a standard. Um, you know, everything has a standard. That is something that is 100% accurate, and then a, you examine everything else by that standard. The, um, Jerry, you're a machinist, so you, you understand this is the same technique the machinists use to calibrate their tools. There is a standard, and they have to get the tools recalculated recalcul uh, uh, and calibrated often because uh, they, the tolerances are so small for error that they want to make sure that they're exact. And you don't do that in the backyard. You send it to a company that calibrate based upon a standard of measurements. So before we answer this question, we must determine the standard. By what standard are we going to evaluate the contradictions or the apparent contradictions in the Bible? Now, for me, and this is just my firm conviction, you don't have to agree with me, I don't, um, I don't have any problem with anybody. I, I feel very confident that every man should be fully persuaded in their own mind. So, I, I don't intend to be a bull in a china closet, nor do I intend to impose my convictions on anybody else. But uh, just to state honestly, my firm conviction, for me, the standard is the authorized version of the Bible. It's commonly known as the King James Version. Um, but uh, let me give you a brief explanation of why I believe this way. All right, I'm not going to go in great depth because um, I've spent probably uh, 12 or 13 years uh, investigating this. And <clears throat> it can get as dry as toast. And I don't want to take you down that deep. But... Um, let me give you a, a brief explanation of why I believe my personal conviction that the standard is the authorized version of the Bible. N number one, it is important for us to understand there are no original autographs of the Bible in existence. Uh, commonly, you'll hear people from time to time, they'll say, well, in the original, and they'll refer to the original as the original Bible. There is no such thing. That is a figment of someone's imagination. Um, there is no such thing as original. There are no original copies of anything that anybody has ever found. All we have are copies of copies of copies of copies of copies. <laughs> That's it. That's all there are. These copies are not complete Bibles, so it's not like you know you have a stack of 25 Bibles and they're all copied of copied of copied. They're not complete Bibles, but thousands and thousands of uh, pieces of my real small to medium size pieces of pages and passages. 
Now, to understand that a little bit, you have to understand that uh, in the day that the Bible was written, they were written on animal skins and on a, a vellum uh, and papyrus uh, uh, material, uh, a lot like our, our old-style newspaper print paper. And if you've ever been at a doctor's office or some public place like that and bored waiting for your time to, to be called to go to your appointment, and you look around and there's these newspapers laying around the hospital or something like that, if you're there late in the day, by the time you get the sports page, which is what all the men go after and the lifestyle of rich and famous, I think the ladies, I don't know, I'm just kidding. But uh, uh, they, they're practically a limp. I mean, they're just, there's no stiffness to them. They're, they're, they have edges that tear real easy. Uh, some of the ink has already moved off of it. Uh, that's, that's what the Bible was copied on, that kind of material. And they deteriorate both with use and with age. And so there were thousands and thousands of these pieces of pages and passages. Now, all of these pieces and pages were collected, they were correlated, and then they were compared. Um, like they might find 600 uh, that combined, that uh, pieces that had a portion of John 3.16 on them. And so they would take and compare all those pieces and find out if, you know, maybe his last half a verse was on one piece and the first three words were on another piece and the two center words were on another piece and like this. They compared them all to see if there was any consistency in that. Because if you had John 3.16 and there were 15 different ways to say John 3.16, that wouldn't be consistent. But they, that's what they did. They cor collected, correlated, and compared all these. And I put this little chart, a triangle behind me, to show you what they came up with. 95% of all the manuscripts that they discovered agreed with one another. 95% of them. And uh, yeah, the painstaking task to do this, it wasn't the work of one person, but a collection of a lot of people who were just trying to, to co collect, correlate, and compare. 95% of those that they discovered agreed or matched each other. Only 5%, this darkened area over here, only 5% did not agree. And so they separated the 5% uh, from the 95%. And then in uh, the mid-40s and in the, the 50s, uh, through an archaeological, archaeological dig, don't say that real fast, um, they discovered multiple artifacts. And this was towards Egypt in the Jordan Valley, um, among those artifacts that were found were what has now become known as the Dead Sea Scrolls. And when they found that in the mid-40s to 50s, um, they were amazed at how well preserved those pieces and scrolls were. I might mention along with this in this dig in the same strata layer. Do you know how they do that? There's a you know they the strata layers of the earth, and then they do a, an experiment it's called carbon fourteen. It's a scientific experiment that gives them the date of a strata layer, and then then everything in that strata layer they say is that that date used carbon-14. Carbon-14 goes on the assumption that the atmosphere of the earth has always been the same. If you're a Bible believer, you know that didn't, that's not true. But at any rate, science is science. They're trying to learn things. And uh, so carbon-14 was the way that they did that. And uh, among these, among the things that they found in this archaeological dig with the Dead Sea Scrolls was um, um, a young mummified, partly mummified um, child, 6 to 12 years old, that's uh, 6,000 years old. And also a, a basket 
that they discovered that they dated 10,500 years old. So how you could get that in the same strata layer where um, the Bible was written somewhere around 30 to 40 AD is with this mummified 6,000 year old mummy and 10,500 year old basket. I don't, I don't know how you do that. But, you know, obviously they don't have to convince me, they're convinced. But that should tell you a little bit about the subject. Okay. So when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls and other of these pieces in the mid 40s to 50s, um, they compared those fragments that they found with this. And the majority of them in the Dead Sea Scrolls aligned themselves with the 5%. They did not align themselves with the 95%. So the majority of the Dead Sea Scrolls and the fag fragments that they found with it did not agree with the 95% of all the other manuscripts that had been discovered. And so what they did is they divided, uh, prior to the Dead Sea Scrolls, they divided these 5% and the 95%, and again, I'm not going in great depth, so I'm just kind of giving an overview, into two different families of manuscripts. And there's there are names for them, I'm just not going to try to con confuse you with it. But they divided the manuscripts into two, two families. This was one family. And this was the other family. From those families of manuscripts, they made translations into Greek. And... The authorized version was taken from these 95%. Every translation other than the King James in existence today comes from the 5%. So it doesn't matter what, it, what translation it is, um, the NIV, the NASB, the RSV, the NET, the LT, the these are all acronym, acronyms for the different, you know, New International Translation, Living Translation, um, uh, the New American Standard uh, Bible, uh, the Revised Standard Version, all these. It doesn't matter. The issue is not about the uh, version of your Bible. The issue is about the family that they came from. Okay? So... Every other Bible other than the authorized version came from these 5% that agreed with what they found near Alexandria, Egypt um, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, so, when they dated the Dead Sea Scrolls, they dated them based upon where they dug and they came out saying that the Dead Sea Scrolls are the oldest manuscripts that they've discovered, and therefore they are the most reliable, because they're the oldest. Now, uh, all this was done based upon the dating, as I mentioned, about carbon-14 and, and things of that nature. Um, but that's, that's the bottom line between versions. Uh, if, you, if you look at the, like the New American Standard Bible, they boast themselves of being a transliteration, word-for-word -word transliteration. And um, they say <clears throat> that gives you the opportunity to, to, to know exactly. Like uh, in the King James, when they italicize words, those are words that the translators added to make the sentence flow. And so they italicize them so that you would know that. That that translating from Greek to English, the languages are different and our expressions are different. And so in the King James Bible, the italicized words are words that the translators added like and, A and D, or something like that, just to, to, so that it works in the English language. But they wanted to make sure that you knew what those words were, so they italicized them. 
a transliterization, a transliterization of a passage doesn't do that, supposedly. Um, although the New American Standard Bible does, that they boast themselves of being a transliteration. But it doesn't matter what version you go to, it's about the family. That's all there is to it. Um, if you examine the family of the people that were surrounding the 5% and the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, it gives you um, a biography of the people that kept these and um, used these. It, you can also get a biography of the uh, people that used the 95% ones. And that's telling. We won't go into that, but it's just to say that, that that's there. Um, so, kind of an interesting thing is this 5% in the Dead Sea Scrolls follow more of a, a Roman uh, belief system. And they begin in Egypt. They were origin of them is more Egypt. And we know something in the Bible about Egypt. It's a type of the what? The world. Okay. And uh, so that, that is just something to consider. The origin of this was at Antioch. And if you know your Bible, in Acts, I believe it's 16, the disciples were first called Christians at where? Antioch. If you follow the history of the 95% that agree together, you will find them to begin in Antioch, spread through Asia, and follow the, the Great Reformation, which we spoke about the Great Reformation before, but the Great Reformation was about breaking the power of Rome and the dominance that Rome had. Martin Luther pounding the thesis on the door that he believed the just shall live by faith. And uh, so the Reformation was people coming out of this Roman dominance to embrace biblical Christianity. And, um, and the, that Reformation that began uh, in Germany spread through all of Europe and then over into the Americas. And uh, the great revivals that we read of Finney and and Billy Sunday, and, and um, I, I mean, there are thousands of names, uh, the Wesley brothers, all, all that follows this 95%. All of them. Um, the only thing that you find over here are educated people. Um, and critical thinking. So, that it's a it's really it's a pretty easy. I, I just didn't want to just have general knowledge. So I de dug in pretty deep, but this is a, a fair overview of um, the issues that, um, in in my opinion, um, bring to me the conviction that I have. Along with this which I would just call data, okay, is a spiritual focus. And that is, from the very beginning of time, what did we learn about Satan and his first entrance into the scene of the human race? In Genesis chapter 3, do you remember the passage? Eve is there. And in chapter 3, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. And he said to Eve, what? Yea, hath God said. The very first thing that Satan did to corrupt this world was to show doubt on his word. On God's word. And he's, he's never stopped. I mean, it's, it was so effective. I mean, we don't know that that occurred three or four times in Genesis. I tend to believe that it was one time. Um, but, I mean, it was so effective. Eve took the fruit right then. And so, the fact that 
that is Satan's strategy would even lend more to me conviction based upon the data that I just shared with you is that Satan's desire is to corrupt the word. Now, because of that, um, I, I start looking at, okay, let's look at the changes that are made between the versions. Again, it's really just two families. It doesn't really matter. But to look at the versions, the ones that come from this, what do I see? What are the changes? Uh, I have a little pamphlet. It's called All the Changes in, in the Versions. And it lists the different versions from the King James and it, it shows all the different changes. Um, but, I, and that's, that's a good read, but it, it, sometimes it can seem almost like they're splitting hairs. Um, here's what I like to do. I like to look at it and say, okay, is there a theme of the difference? And the answer is yes. I mean, it is obvious that there is a theme. It's not just that they're different. There is a theme to the difference. Okay? So when I look at the Bible, uh, I look at three passages of Scripture in the New Testament. And I'll give you these three passages. You can turn with me. Matthew chapter 1. And these are just, this is just easy. Okay? Matthew chapter 1, verse 25. This is the first one I look, anytime a new Bible comes out, even though I already know, uh, I just look just to, I guess because I'm curious. Uh, Matthew chapter 1, verse 25. And notice here, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. In every translation outside of this family, firstborn is missing. And that's the theme. All the way through, every one of the ones in this family, the virgin birth is attacked. Verses that we hold so dear, uh, uh, showing us that Mary was a virgin, uh, in this family, they're all missing. All right, so there's another verse that I look at, and it's John chapter 1. John chapter 1 and verse 8. Now there's, now there's hundreds of these verses. I just, you know, it's hard to look at 100 verses. So I just look at these three. And it just tells me more than I need to know. John chapter 1 verse 18. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. The word only begotten is missing. Now, the only begotten is interesting because, Rita, I know you've been a Christian a long time. He came into his own, John 1, 11, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them give he power to become the what? Sons of God. Now, that's interesting because all the new versions that come from this family say the one and only son. But are we not sons of God who have trusted in Jesus as our Savior? See, it's not, it's not sons of God or son of God. It is only begotten. The only begotten of God. Now, this is real interesting. I don't have the reference in front of me, but we've looked at it before. Because words matter. And this is what's so great about a standard. If you have a standard, then you can start comparing all these words that are like words, which is what we've been doing in the adult Sunday school class. You know, as we're going down through these principles, um, the words are important. So if you go to Hebrews and it talks about um, Isaac, all right, and it talks about him as being the only begotten son of his father. But we know that Isaac wasn't the only son, but he was the only begotten son. And this is important. And those are the cross-references in the Bible. 
And the reason that he was the only begotten is because it was designed his mother and his dad both. And Jesus is the only begotten because it involved the Holy Spirit and Mary. All right. The prophecy was that the Spirit of God would overshadow you. Okay. And so the only begotten is a very important word. Why would someone not want to maintain the understanding of only begotten is because they want to take away the deity of Christ. You have the humanity. That's the baby born in the manger. That's the reason everybody loves Christmas. All right. And then you have the divinity. That's God wrapped in human flesh. And if Jesus is God in the flesh, then a lot of beliefs go crashing. <laughs> okay. So they want to remove that. So almost everyone from this family removes the word begotten. Not just in John 1.18, but in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Yep. They say one and only son. So, so there's a theme. It's not just that they're different, but there's a theme to their differences. I'll give you another verse. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. 1 Timothy 3 and verse 16. This is such a powerful verse. And, and I know these, what I'm saying, it doesn't impact you as much, maybe, because you already know these things. So if you're reading down through Matthew chapter 1, and you get to the end and it says, and uh, Joseph knew her not till she gave forth her son. What do you have in your mind? Firstborn. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it doesn't impact you so much because you're you already thinking firstborn. Or you get to John three sixteen. God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son. What are you thinking? Begotten. Yeah. So you already know that. It's not you that we're worried about. Do you remember what it says? about the nation of Israel. They went down into Egypt. Joseph became second only to Pharaoh down there. Do you remember what happened? There arose a generation that knew not the Lord. See, that's the, that's the danger. The danger is, is that as you continue to erode the prince of these themes, doctrinal themes of the Bible, a generation raises up that doesn't know that. And it becomes very easy for someone to teach them otherwise because they don't even have a standard to check about. So, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. This is very interesting. I love the expression of the uh, King James Authorized Version. Without controversy. <laughs> you know what that means? And nobody can argue about it. Okay. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Now, remember, we used this, we did that study in what are the mysteries of the Bible. And so this was one of them that we went through. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. So what's this? the question that we would ask after that? What's the mystery of godliness? That's, I mean, that's what he's getting ready to tell us. What is it? Who was manifest in the flesh? God was manifest in the flesh. Well, who, who do we know was manifest in the flesh? Jesus. So what's the text saying, Jesus? Who is Jesus? He is God. <laughs> yeah, okay. Again, the divinity of Jesus. This is about the triune being that Jesus is God. So, how do we know that, th that this is Jesus in the text? John chapter 1, verse 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Okay. So, so comparing these, every version that comes from this family removes the word God. Every version removes the word God. And it substitutes he or they or but it removes God. So there's this theme. This 5% isn't just different readings. It's thematic that attacks the virgin birth, the deity of Christ, the Godhead, the triuneness of God. Um, we, we we're not going to go into it, but I could go on to say it, it attacks the blood atonement. They're all thematic. 
there's a theme to the changes. And remember I said there was a bio to this group and there's a bio of people that are connected to this. When you look at the bio of the people that are, are connected with this, <laughs> they, they didn't believe that Jesus was God. They didn't believe that Mary was a virgin. And so they just changed it. And that's the reason their readings are different than these readings and they're thematic because they had a predetermination. What's one of the things that we've talked about in the adult Sunday school class and here on Wednesday night is there's a major difference between a person that goes to the Bible and makes the Bible subjected, subjected to them from a person that goes to the Bible and says, I'm subjected to it. One of the things that happened to me early in my Christian life is I said, if I find a problem in the Bible, it's me. <laughs> All right. And that is, I, I never think, uh oh, the Bible has a problem. It, I always acknowledge it must be me. There's something I haven't figured out. Because I don't subject the Bible to me, I'm subjected to it. Let God be true and every man a liar. So I subject myself to the Word of God. I say, you know, if, if I find something I don't understand, the understanding problem is with me. It isn't that God made a mistake. Now, I want you to look at Psalms 12. And in Psalms chapter 12, I want you to look at um, verse 6 and 7. Psalms 12. Verse 6 and 7. The words of the Lord are pure words. How pure? As silver tried in a furnace of earth. What does that do? Purified seven times. <laughs> so, uh, and seven is significant. God created the earth in six days, and what did he do on the... Rested. He rested. You know why? It was complete. God saw, and it was good. Okay. So, when God does things, he does it in sevens. Eight in the Bible is the number of new beginnings. So, seven is completion. It's finished. That's the reason it's significant in the passage. How tried are they? Purified seven times. They're complete. They're perfect. Okay. Now, look. The, the responsibility for keeping God's word is not with man. In fact, in verse 7, God said it was his responsibility. Thou shalt keep them, what? The words of the Lord. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So there's a promise that God said of this, he's going to preserve. And all we have to do is find out where it is that he preserved. Would he preserve something that took away his deity? Would he preserve something that attacked the blood? Would he preserve something that attacked the virgin birth of Christ? I mean, it goes on and on and on. Again, I, I don't mean to be so redundant, but these changes of these 5% in the Dead Sea Scrolls are all thematic. They all follow a theme. It's an attack on what we know to be true. 95% of all that's been found agrees together. It's just this small faction over here that doesn't. And so, um, the 95%, the this family here, these are the ones that got burned at the stake for their faith. These are the ones that moms saw their babies ripped from their arms hung over the top of the pig's pen and said, if you renounce Christ, we won't drop your baby into the pigs. And with tears flowing down their face, they said, we cannot renounce the one that we love. And they dropped the children and watched the pigs devour their child. Oh, I, I don't know if I could do that or not. These that are the, would be horrible. These are the people that make, I said they have a bio, there's a biography of people that loved not their life unto the death to preserve this scripture. And there's a bio of these people over here that attack the very beliefs that I mentioned and more. All right, so as we look at that, 
I, I, again, I could go very deep into the issue, and uh, we're getting close to the end, and I haven't even got the question yet. Um, I just wanted to briefly reveal why I have such strong convictions and hold personally the authorized version as a standard of authority. Because if we took each one of these questions, and there's about six of these, uh, what they thought were apparent contradictions that we're going to go summarily, we're going to go through them. They may not be contradictions in different versions. Or we couldn't even find the answer to it in different versions because the aversions don't even agree. Of these 5% in the Dead Sea Scroll, they don't all agree with each other. That's kind of interesting. Even the 5% don't agree together. Because some of the people in this bio list believed in baptismal regeneration, meaning that in order to get saved, you have to be baptized. This family over here is where the Dure Reims Bible comes from. All right, so, uh, so this, this thematic attempt to form a belief, and they change it. Now, in all fairness, just so that you understand, uh, cults do this. So there's no, there's no reason in John chapter 1, none, there is no manuscript anywhere that changes John chapter 1, verse 1, the way the Jehovah Witness Bible reads. John chapter 1, verse 1, the Jehovah Witness Bible reads, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. Like the King James, and almost every version, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But they had to add that word a, God, to match what they believe. So when the Bible doesn't support what we believe, we don't change what we believe, we change the Bible. And that's, that's what you find over here in this family. They do it subtly, and they do it through education. They do it through superior, godly, dedicated uh, scholarship. All right? And uh, so those are the difference between those. Um, I, I have no problem with someone that doesn't agree with my conviction at all. None. Doesn't bother me a bit. Um, you know, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Uh, Romans chapter 14. I, I feel so strongly in that. Um, you don't have to give account for what I believe, and I don't have to give account for what you believe. We each have to give account of ourselves unto God. And so I, I never split hairs with anybody. I never have a hard time with anybody. Uh, they, they can believe whatever they want. And I have family members that don't agree with me. But we still love each other. I mean, you know, in heaven we'll find out who's right. <laughs> Amen. And in heaven we'll be so righteous in God's righteousness that we won't gloat over the fact that we were right or wrong, okay? So, so you know, we'll find out later by and by. But that is the reason I hold such strong convictions. This just brief overview. And again, I didn't just pick up a book and read something, but uh, so I've spent a lot of years looking at that because to me that's very important. And uh, But when we answer these questions, uh, for all of our uh, uh, virtual people that are with us, as well as our church family, I will be answering these apparent contradictions by and with the standard, the authorized version, okay? Now, I, we have time because it's a real short one. The first question of contradiction concerns the season and events that we are currently separate, uh, celebrating. So I thought that was interesting. That's the reason I wanted to do it tonight because next week it'll seem like old hat. Okay, the question is this. Was it a man or a woman who confronted Peter when Jesus was being questioned and tortured by Pilate? Was it a man or a woman who questioned Peter? So let's look at a couple of scriptures. Mark chapter 14. And if you have something to mark, you know, like a piece of paper or something to stick in your Bible um, in these places, I think you'll, you'll find it uh, helpful. Uh, Mark chapter 14. And then uh, Luke chapter 22. Mark 14 and Luke chapter 22. 
Mark 14, and look at verse 69. Read it out loud with me, okay? And a maid saw him again and began to say to them that stood by, this is one of them. Maid, male or female? Female. female. Okay. All right, now let's look at Luke chapter 22 and look at verse 58. And after a little while, y'all with me? Verse 58. And after a little while, another saw him and said, Thou art also of them. And Peter said, Woman, I am not. Well, says man. man, okay. Man, I am not. Now, I, I have to say that a lot of people, when they read this, they think of Peter responding the way we would today. Is, man, it's hot out today. And you're not meaning masculine, it's hot out today. You're just, just a figure of speech. But that's, that's not what he said. He said, man, I am am not. So the question is, is which is it, a man or, or a woman? Well, if we looked at all the places that this occurred, we call it the synopsis of the gospel, where we check each of the gospels to see it, um, it would be an interesting read. We don't have time to do that. So let me just get to the answer. Um, you're going to be so happy. I just got right to it. Okay. All right. Um, the answer to the question is found in Luke's account. Notice in Luke chapter 22, verse 58 again, it says, and after a little while, what's the next word? Another. Another. Ah, another saw him. So that's an interesting thing. Another saw him. And what was his answer? Man, I am not. Now look at John 18. John 18. So this is a great example of when I read in the Bible and it seems like there's an apparent contradiction, I don't say, oh no, there's a mistake in the Bible. I say, I need to do it, dig a little deeper. The answer is here, but you know, uh, if you're in first grade, you get a first grade reader, but if you're doing your graduate work in college, it's a little bit tougher. And so, you know, let a man be fully persuaded and then the Bible also says that we're to uh, show ourselves a prudent to God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So we have to dig a little bit deeper. John chapter 18, look at verse number 25. And Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. What's the next word? They. They or him or her? They. They, they said therefore unto him, Art thou not also one of the thy? So the they in John 18... And the man and another in Luke chapter 22 tells us what many of us never have been taught in our life is that there were two. There was both a man and a woman that approached Peter in Pilate's judgment hall. Two of them that noticed. But who's the only one we hear about? The maid. But there were two. And so um, there's no contradiction in the Bible. Um, uh, can I let you in on a little, this kind of a humorous thing, but it's serious too. I, I believe God wrote the Bible in such a way that if a person comes to it with this critical, yea, hath God said, approach, God will give them enough rope to hang themselves. I mean, I honestly believe that. I believe he has, you know, okay, you don't want to give me the benefit of the doubt. You want me to make be the one that made the mistake and not you, I'll give you enough rope to support that. And you can just go right ahead and hang yourself. I, I just, I personally, I believe that. But if you come to the Bible and say, God, I'm stupid and ignorant and I do not know apart from what? Jesus said, I have to leave, but I'm going to give you a comforter. And when he comes, what's he going to do? He is going to bear witness to the truth. And so inside my chest, if I say, God, I don't know, but I, I know that you don't make any mistakes and, and the understanding problem is with me, could you help me? What's the Spirit of God that's in me going to do? He's going to help me find it. All right. And again, that's my submission to it rather than it being submitted to me. That's a, that is a big, big issue in the Christian life. And uh, so you just think with that point for a second is, 
All right, I go through a trial. There's two approaches to that. God, why are you doing this to me? See, that is God being submitted to me. The other response to it is, I know all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. God, what are you getting ready to do in my life? You see those two approaches? And they're based on the same thing. Either God is submitted to me, or I'm submitted to God. And either I'm submitted to his word, or his word is submitted to me. And then I can criticize God if he's submitted, if I, you know, he's submitted to me, because I can say, what are you doing? Well, I mean, after all, I give my tithe every week. <laughs> you know, that has to count for something, <laughs> you know. And I got, oh, I'm so sorry, I forgot all about that. Yeah, here, let me take that back away from you, because that's really unfair. But, I mean, people think like that, honestly. But I uh, want to be the person that when a trial or a situation comes in my life, I say, God, you're getting ready to do something great, and I don't want to miss it. Okay. And so, but it's, but it's based on the same thing about submission. And I submit to God's Word. So, in this... The they lets us know that there were two, and it is a man and a woman who confront Peter. Now, there's four more questions uh, about the contra apparent contradictions that we're going to examine over the next few weeks. Some of them are a little more difficult than this one was, but it's, it's fun. I, I, I've always enjoyed this. Um, you know, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, um, a lot of people are familiar with the stories, but not familiar with the texts. But there's a lot of numbers in the Old Testament. And one whole book, that's what the name of the book is, numbers. Okay, a lot of numbers in the Old Testament. And there's a lot of discrepancies, apparent discrepancies between the numbers. And um, this uh, uh, person did not bring up any of those. Thank goodness. Okay, <laughs> but uh, th there's an answer to them all. And uh, again, if we use a standard, the standard always will give us the same results every time. Okay? All right. Well, I hope that you enjoyed that. Again, if you if you don't, um, if a person watching online or, um, you know, someone that's here in the house, um, you, you don't have to agree with me on that uh, issue of the authorized version. That's, that's just my personal conviction. I try to make that uh, up front to let you know that. And I, I have no apologies for it, but I, I, I wouldn't force that upon anybody. Um, but it, the, one of the fascinating days in my life, um, when I got saved, I didn't even know there were different versions. I mean, I just ran and got a Bible that my grandma had. Uh, you know, she was a good godly lady, and I thought, man, I, I want to be like her. And, and uh, uh, she never talked about it being the King James or the Authorized or anything. It was just the Bible, you know. And uh, back then, you could get it in a... In a uh, dime store, what they call dime store. There's not many of those things left. But you go to dime store, you could get one of those cardboard back uh, Bibles for a dollar, and um, they were all over the place. And then things have changed. And now, uh, about every two years, one comes out. Oh, I forgot one of the important things. There's only one Bible that comes from this family. That's the authorized version. Every other one comes from this one. This is the only Bible that's not copyrighted. Every one of these is copyrighted. You say, why is that important? Why do you have something copyrighted? So you can't change it. So you can't change it, and what? Make money. You make money. Because no one can duplicate what you've done. And... This has been, never has been copyrighted, ever. They want it freely distributed. But you have to seek permission and then pay a fee to, to duplicate these over here. That's another issue that's separate from the others that I thought that was always important. Uh, if you ever are really bored and you want to read something really great, um, find an old... Um, authorized version and read the preface to the readers. It's several pages long and it's written in that King's English, so it's, a, it's like reading Shakespeare, okay? Or a lot like reading uh, 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 um, 
him. <laughs> Can't think of his name right now, but um, Spurgeon. Uh, if you've ever read Spurgeon, it's like you know three paragraphs, and he still hadn't used a period. <laughs> it's really interesting, and uh, but it's it's a lot like that. But the preface to the reader will tell you the intent of those men and what they did. Okay, all right. Well, let's go to prayer. Um, uh, Betty's not here to help me with my heavy uh, 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 lifting, so uh, I'm, I'm going to have to carry the burden myself. Uh -huh. uh, Bill had surgery today. It had been postponed from Monday. I uh, had surgery today, and uh, uh, the surgeons did what's referred to as a drain, a brain drain of blood. And... Um, he, uh, the procedure was about 45 minutes. It went well. Uh, afterwards, he's had some uh, trying times. They said that that goes along with the procedure, uh, some seizures and some uh, disorientation. Um, but um, they're going to keep him in the ICU at Miami Valley for a few days uh, just to monitor him. So keep him in prayer. Um, I know that he is anxious to get home. Um, and uh, Eileen's having uh, knee issues uh, after a fall. Uh, Bernie and Norleen have moved to the landings. They're going to go through some adjustments. Um, I think you got the um, uh, one call uh, most everybody did about uh, the grandson, uh, girlfriend, um, uh, had a baby boy, three pounds, two ounces. And uh, premature birth there. There were some complications. Everybody's doing fine. Um, and uh, their nephew also is in intensive care. Um, Anna has, uh, she just has a continuing battle. Um, she had a great day yesterday. And then as the evening wore on, got very, very sick. I had to take her to the emergency room the port into her kidney um, and um, so she's probably been back to the ER uh, a half a dozen times already since she was dismissed and um, uh, just continue to pray for her uh, they're doing an MRI um, of the kidney to see if there's any uh, uh, cancer or infection there so um, keep her in prayer um, Mary Lane's sister in place in assistance living, and I know that uh, that's way heavy on Mary Lane's heart. Um, Dave's uh, father had successful surgery, and he came home the 27th. He's recovering very nicely. Um, Joan's sister is home from the hospitals, challenging road ahead for her. Ed had um, that second surgery but the doctor stopped because of a blockage and uh, I talked uh, with his uh, daughter Sunday and um, they uh, they're anxiously awaiting the surgery uh, I think they were going to do a uh, an MRI or a CT scan on him before they did that surgery but keep him in prayer and then Pat's uh, nephew uh, about the heart uh, also her sister is in the hospital um, and um, she has um, she's been on our prayer list uh, for a while I'm looking down through here to see if uh, I see her I don't write off but uh, um, keep her in prayer Pat's sister and then um, she, we've been praying for her she has um, diabetes and uh, infection in her foot, and um, the doctors want to amputate, so keep her in your prayers. Uh, for Anne, um, they uh, continue to um, adjust their um, approach to fixing her, um, or attempting to correct her vision, uh, continue to remember her, um, of course, Barb with her issues from the fall, and Judy had successful surgery, um, is recuperating in the hospital, and it 
talks there about their connection with their church family. Remember, if you would, oh, here it is, under others who have been asked to pray for, it's number two. That's Pat's sister, Becky. Okay. She is not at Dorothy Love right now. Keep her, she's in the hospital, Wilson. Okay. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, and uh, we'll pray uh, for tomorrow's service. And... Um, as well as uh, this week, Sunday's a big day. Always uh, like uh, Sunday sunrise service out here. It looks like Sunday's supposed to be pretty nice. I've been out there before where my feet stuck to the back end of the pickup truck. It was so cold. You've been out there too. <laughs> and uh, so it looks like it's going to be a little bit nicer. We'll sing all three verses of the song this year. <laughs> at one, I just barely got out one verse and every head bowed, every eye closed. You know, let's pray and get in there to eat. But uh, uh, we'll meet out there uh, Sunday morning early for our sunrise service. And um, we pray for that as well. Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for our time tonight. For our family, virtual, as well as here in... Um, uh, the church, uh, as we meet together on this Wednesday night, to uh, study your word, but uh, Lord, to focus on people who need our prayers. And uh, Lord, we certainly uh, reach our hand and our heart and our prayers out to Bill, uh, our dear brother in the Lord, and uh, going through some heavy, heavy times in his life, the loss of his wife, and now this uh, issue uh, that he's confronted with, uh, the loss of a lot of weight, uh, a bit of dis disorientation and uh, falling. And I just pray, Father, that you'd be with him as they've gone through and done this procedure that uh, that may relieve the problem and that, Lord, from it, um, uh, he may regain uh, his mobility and his strength and get back into things. Lord, I also, not on our prayer list, but just a personal note, want to also bring to you Linda, uh, I know that she uh, is concerned about many things in her life and going back in to have some therapy. And I just pray that you'd be with her and uh, her husband and uh, minister to both of them. Uh, keep them safe, I pray, Father. And uh, do for them what uh, gives you the most glory, and we praise you for that. I pray, Father, also for Eileen. And I just ask that you continue to be with her after her fall. Um, and uh, the complications with her health. Uh, Lord, for Bernie and Norlene, uh, it's, it's a sad and a happy thing at the same time, seeing Bernie struggle so much just to get up um, in uh, church from his pew and uh, watching him walk and being so unstable. It brings us great joy to know that uh, there are going to be some place where uh, they will be cared for uh, according to their need. Uh, it's also a sad thing. We're so uh, used to seeing them sit in their place. And uh, we pray, Father, that uh, you would just be with them and minister to them. For Jeff and uh, Cheryl, uh, Lord, there's a lot going on in their family. And we just offer them to you tonight. The nephew, Gary, and grandson, Steve, Sarah, and their new little baby boy. Uh, Father, just pray that you'd be with them and minister to their needs. Thank you for answering our prayer. I know as soon as it came through on the one call, uh, prayed right then, and uh, Lord, just thankful for the outcome that we've seen. For Anna, my niece, we just offer to you her. Uh, she has been such a wonderful testimony, Lord, to so many people, and we appreciate uh, you allowing her uh, and her strength uh, in the midst of the adversity she's gone through to be an example to us. I have never, ever one time heard her say that God is unkind or unfair. Uh, she has always said that God is always right and he's always good. Uh, Lord, in our, our way of thinking as humans, we would say you should uh, heal her completely and, and uh, uh, give her a television program and a radio podcast and all this so she could just broadcast over the whole world the great things that God has done. Uh, we know that our ways are not yours and um, that, Lord, sometimes you choose a different path than we would. Uh, we seem to think that we know what would bring you the most glory, but Lord, you know. And so we 
defer from our own understanding to you and we say God be praised through her life and I pray Father uh, that you would be with her and I know that when she is sick she is really sick and not many people could stand over an extended period of time uh, the uh, suffering that she's gone through and the pain that she's endured Lord I pray that you'd give her grace as she goes through it that she may be able to forget those yesterdays and think only of tomorrow's. God, I pray that you bless her. Father, we pray that you'd be with uh, Mary Lane's sister and uh, that the uh, placement in the assisted living will be helpful. She would acclimate herself uh, quickly. Uh, just be with her and calm Mary Lane's heart. Uh, Lord, thank you for providing her for her sister. Uh, we continue to rejoice in the success of the surgery of Dave's dad and pray, Father, that um, he may honor you uh, with how you've blessed him. Pray, Father, for Joan's sister, Jean, and uh, Lord, a lot of uh, challenges that are ahead for her. I pray, Father, that you'd be with her, and may she and Joan just draw them close together, and may it also give them the opportunity uh, to communicate the goodness of our God to one another and shout it from the mountaintops. For Ed and Judy, Lord, we just give them to you. They always... Um, issues and um, Lord you have sustained their life for so long uh, Judy in the midst of her struggle and battle with cancer and uh, Ed with his battle with many different things and I just pray Father that you would continue to be with them and minister to them now you know what they need long before we ask and so we offer them to you Lord uh, trusting that you would do what pleases you and gives you glory for Pat Nephew Steve, who's waiting for this uh, heart transplant, uh, I think uh, along with that, I would pray for the pastor of a uh, church in uh, Ludlow Falls, who also is uh, in need of a heart transplant. Uh, Dale is his name, and I just pray, Father, that you'd be with Dale and uh, the doctors and uh, allow uh, God uh, that in your timing uh, for that prayer to be answered. I pray, Father, also for... Uh, Pat's uh, sister and the issue here with the foot and uh, the problem with it healing. Uh, Lord, just give her to you and pray, Father, that you'd be with her. For Anne, uh, Lord, our heart is broken for her. And uh, uh, if uh, she cannot see, it just changes her whole life. And we know that, Lord, you're, you're good and right all the time. Uh, we just uh, express to you our heart's desire. We know that you care. Uh, and that um, you're touched with the feelings of our infirmities. And so, Lord, we ask that you would touch Anne. It, it is not outside of the realm of you to heal her. Uh, Lord, I, I, but I pray your will might be done on her behalf. For Barb as well, uh, recovering from these uh, uh, two places in her wrist that uh, broke, I pray, Father, that you would speed her recovery and minimize her pain. Lord, for Judy and Andy, they have gone through some really rough times. I pray that you continue to be with them. Minister to Judy as she recovers from this surgery. And Andy, as uh, he uh, gets acclimated to their new home, I pray that things would continue to work out as um, the uh, diaconate and others from our church uh, try to assist them in um, uh, uh, being able to live in this new place. Uh, Lord, we communicate uh, to all those that are watching and we have talked tonight about these two services that are upcoming that are so special. It's the tradition, it's the memory, um, these things do in remembrance of me, and Lord, we do that this Thursday uh, in our minds, retracing the time uh, that you uh, met with your disciples the last time. I pray, Father, that it be a memorable service. And our first uh, time in a year that I, I believe that we've had communion. And I just pray, Father, that it would be a great time for our church family. I pray also, Lord, for sunrise service, that, uh, Lord, the great joy of the Christian experience is that, why seek ye the living? The angel said, among the dead, he is not here, for he is risen. And uh, I thank you, Lord, that we uh, have read the end of the book and we know how the story ends. And that, uh, Lord, death could not keep his prey. He tore the bars away. And we rejoice in that. And pray, Father, that you would uh, uh, allow us to be joyous 
and uh, the fact that because Christ is risen, we also shall rise. To Martha, Martha, it was Jesus said, who said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Believest thou this? And Lord, we just rejoice that we have this opportunity to remember the great, great day when the stone they found rolled away. Father, bless our time together. Sunday morning, as uh, many people come that have not or do not traditionally go every week to church, uh, may we have a blessed time a fellowship together. Now, I pray, Father, that you dismiss us and give us safety as we go on our way home. Thank you, Lord, for all of your many blessings. We are the beneficiary of all the things that you do for us. And we never want to be ungrateful or unthankful. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you very much. God bless you. Thanks for joining us. And see you tomorrow evening.